here I represent my PI Kai Yuguan, my co-PI Chen Peng, and my um, other collaborators Bin Peng and Yunnan Luo. And I'll be talking about uh, foreca forecasting crop productivity uh, with high resolution satellite data. So the final objective of our project is to improve our predicting skills for regional and global crop yield by integrating advanced remote sensing observations, uh, mostly satellite imagery, and process-based modeling. So why satellite remote sensing for agriculture? Um, the, obvious, uh, one, uh, the, the ob obvious answer is that we have a huge data set. Um, satellite uh, imagery covers a great uh, um, range, both spatially and temporally. And more importantly, it's a uniform and standardized metric of measurement. So that, for example, when we develop a model um, using satellite images uh, for soybeans in Illinois, it's relatively easy to uh, transfer that to, for example, Brazil, because um, we don't depend on any regional, uh, region-specific um, government statistics or um, ground observation. And also, um, satellite image just is very easy to scale up, um, which is impossible for um, traditional ground observations. The, the second question I want to talk about is why we are choosing U the US Corn Belt. So uh, the first reason is um, corn is actually the most important staple food uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the total production. And the U U.S. Midwest Corn Belt actually produces over 45% of global maize production. Um, so um, properly understanding and modeling the U.S. Corn Belt uh, is quite essential um, for the global food security. We work ex extensively on blue waters uh, because um, the computational and storage capacities of blue waters um, allow us to scale up even at fine resolution, and satellite images can be huge. So my talk will have two parts. The first one will be um, the processing of high resolution satellite images, and the second part will be process-based crop modeling. Um, I'll introduce three specific projects that the lab is working on. Uh, the first one will be a um, multi-sensor fusion algorithm for the satellite data. The second one is uh, making use of uh, even higher resolution uh, CubeSat uh, data set. Uh, and the third one will be an improved process-based um, maze modeling uh, work. So high resolution satellite image processing first. Um, we, in this area, we face a dilemma that it's very hard, it's impossible to both have high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. It's just like not realistic for a single uh, platform to have both uh, fine resolution and high revisiting frequency. But unfortunately, that's what we need for agricultural analysis because we need a continuous time series and um, we need to ideally look at each individual field, for example. And this is a list of some of the platforms we are using. Um, if, you, if we start from the bottom, we see um, NASA's MODIS mission, which has 500 meters spatial resolution. And if we go up, we have uh, Landsat or uh, Sentinel-2 of uh, European Space Agency. They have finer resolutions. But if we rank this list again uh, in terms of frequency, then MODIS, which only has 500 meter resolution, the only one that has daily um, data coverage. And this is a picture of uh, what different resolutions look like um, in a, a highway exit and part of a um, field. And as you can see, uh, for agriculture, for a meaningful field level agricultural analysis, we really need at least 30 meter resolution um, to, to do anything actually meaningful. Um, so the first work I'll introduce is their fusion, um, which is a generic and fully automated method of fusing um, images from multiple sensors. Um, it captures the rough uh, time series trend from the high resolution, low, 
uh, high frequency low resolution sensors such as MODIS and the spatial um, details from higher resolution images um, such as Landsat. And again, this is a generic uh, algorithm, uh, but currently we are using, for, uh, using it for fusing MODIS and Landsat so that we have a 30 meter resolution product. Um, and it faces some additional challenges. For example, um, there is cloud and cloud shadows, uh, which cause gaps. And there is a, a malfunction with the Landsat 7 platform's scanline corrector. Uh, so we actually, uh, instead of having a nice image, we have something on the um, right panel uh, with those black lines. And those missing data um, can cause inc inconsistency um, between the uh, data that we actually have um, and the data that we need to fill from previous and um, later images as well as um, the regions surrounding, surrounding it when we are trying to produce a daily frequency cloud-free image. And this is one of the main challenges of this work. And um, I'm just going to play a video of a demonstration of this of this work um, in the Champaign County in the year of 2017. And on the left panel, it's a true color RGB image. On the right panel, it's a, it's a GCVI or a kind of vegetation index. Um, and as you can see at this resolution, it really allows us to do something um, at pixel level. Um, that's, um, that has higher resolution than the outline of each field. The second project I want to talk about uh, is that we are trying to make use of um, what's called CubeSat platforms. So basically, um, it's, a, it's a kind of miniaturized um, satellite platforms. And this particular uh, mission is owned by a private company called Planet Labs. Um, it solves the issue of uh, it solves the trade-off between high resolution and high frequency by using a fleet of almost 200 small um, CubeSat platforms. It has really high resolution, at least for agricultural uses, uh, of three meters. And it has, a, it has a revisiting period of a couple of days, uh, which is really good. But it also, have, it also has problems that are unique to this kind of CubeSat approach. For example, there is inconsistency in the spectral response um, of different platforms, which uh, a single sensor uh, platform su such as Landsat 7 or Landsat 8 doesn't have. Um, it also um, has a smaller um, spectral coverage, so it only has four bands of four filters, um, namely RGB and near infrared, whereas sensors like MODIS and Landsat can have six or seven or more um, bands. And for that reason, the quality assessment algorithm, uh, most, uh, mostly cloud or cloud shadow detection of CubeSats is relatively poor, uh, due to, partly due to the limited number of filters. Um, due to all those reasons, it's, uh, the quality of um, the surface reflectance product is not as ideal uh, as we want for agricultural analysis. Um, it's very good for things like seeing, uh, locating a ship in an ocean or um, counting how many parts there are parked at Walmart, but it's not really um, very good. Um, for agricultural use. And finally, uh, because it's owned by a private company, um, we actually have to purchase the data. So although it has a low revisiting frequency, uh, we do want to reduce the amount of data that we originally acquired as much as possible. And we developed a complete pipeline that generates a more usable uh, planet scope derived data set that is more ready for agricultural analysis. Um, and this work is actually built upon the fusion uh, work that I just talked about. Um, so basically, it uses the fusion product to perform uh, a series of spectral correction and um, all layer or cloud detection and time series smoothing. I'll just skip the whole work 
uh, flowchart and show some results. So this one shows the bigger idea. Here we are using MODIS, but we are, uh, we are actually also using uh, the, the stair fusion product to do an atmospheric correction, which basically corrects what the sensor actually sees um, in the space to um, the ground surface reflectance. Um, and as I said, our main purpose of this work is uh, agricultural analysis, so we can actually acquire uh, more information based on the type of um, the crop type. So, for example, um, soybean field, all soybean fields in Champagne uh, will look pretty much the same, um, although and they, and they share a very similar uh, baseline time series. It could there could be a phase shift or a change in. Um, the magnitude scale, uh, but um, the, the shape should be very similar overall. And we can use this piece of information to um, remove mo more odd layers that are left because of the poor quality of cloud mask. Um, and this is a demonstration of the uh, spectral response correction. Uh, what we do here is that we match the histogram of um, the Planet Lab data set. Even the bottom, of, uh, uh, the bottom of atmosphere reflectance data set to the histogram of stair fusion. And the two pictures probably look pretty much the same um, on the projector, but um, actually um, they have very different resolution. Um, but they do have the same spectral profile. Again, a demonstration of the raw um, data set and the processed um, agricultural use ready data set. And then I want to move on to the last part of the presentation, the last project, uh, which is a process-based um, crop modeling project. Uh, led by Dr. Bin Peng, who is a um, postdoc at our lab. Uh, so traditionally, there are two types, two families of crop models. The first one would be agronomy models. Uh, the second one is earth system models, or ELMs. Um, they, have, they both have their um, advantages and disadvantages. For example, ELMs are more um, numerically explicit. Um, although the model itself is usually not as compl uh, uh, it's usually much simpler than agronom ag agronomical models, um, and this work, the CLM AP Sim, basically integrates the strengths of two um, widely used models uh, belonging to those two families um, and um, improve uh, the overall um, modeling performance. Uh, more specifically, we improved the representation of uh, maize phenological development, which can be very important in crop modeling. And we also corrected the deficiencies in um, the carbon allocation scheme in the original CLM model. Um, again, I'll skip this flowchart uh, and just show some results. Um, on the top left figure, um, we can see that our model's um, prediction of harvest index uh, showing the green box is much closer to the observation showing in gray than the original CLM model, which is showing in red. And similarly, we also, uh, the old model, the, the old CLM model is known for uh, an overestimation of um, below ground biomass, um, which is shown in the uh, figure at the bottom in the left panel um, in the purple color. And our model, uh, which is shown on the right panel, um, is much similar to the observation shown in the middle. Um, although we don't exactly know how well our model performs um, in estimating mating the, the root um, biomass, because we can't really observe that um, empirically. Um, on the right, uh, on the plot on the right, uh, we, you can also see that uh, this new model is also better at as estimating um, canopy height. Um, so our model performance is showing the solid line, 
uh, and you can see it's closer to the dotted observation data than the original CLM model showing the dotted lines. Moving forward, um, we will try to scale up to the entire um, U.S. Midwest Corn Belt uh, instead of um, some, like, currently we are just doing uh, some experiments in Illinois or maybe um, Champaign, uh, the Champaign County. Um, we do intend to scale up to the entire U.S. Corn Belt and uh, we are planning to use explicit calibrations uh, at grade level. And uh, more importantly, we are trying to integrate the satellite data um, to our um, crop modeling step. Now that the fusion algorithm and the uh, CubeSat processing algorithm is uh, completed. And finally, uh, one of the um, bigger goals of our project is to provide a um, real-time forecasting of crop yield. Um, and you can probably see that the roadmap of our project is to um, first um, generate a very, uh, a satellite data set that has really good quality that um, no one has ever had before for agricultural analysis. And then we can push, uh, we can then push the boundary of more advanced um, satellite remote sensing based crop modeling work. Uh, 